thank you, Eon, for having me for this session. Always a pleasure. And um, the topic of discussion this afternoon for me is going to be the role of genetics in personalized. And I have left the rest of it uh, open-ended because genetics it doesn't only impact nutrition, it impacts pretty much everything about us. And I'm going to elaborate on that in the rest of my presentation. Like Sanjana mentioned, I'm the CEO of Xcode Life Sciences. And um, Xcode is a genetics and bioinformatics company. We provide different types of genetic services, including personalized reports, ranging from personalized nutrition to fitness, to precision medicine and a variety of other reports. We have close to a portfolio of about 20 reports, but we constantly expand on a fairly regular basis. Okay, so before I get into the technical details of my presentation, I want to take a moment to reflect on the evolution of medical practice, uh, because I think it has uh, it puts into context the uh, developments that we see across the board in not only medicine, but in other health professions like nutrition and dietetics. So um, back in history, when medical practice per se started, we, had, we didn't really have the stethoscope, we didn't have any of these tools. So we started with symptomatic evaluation, people who show up with different types of symptoms like temperature, vomiting, nausea, and so on. And the physician will interview the, the patient and understand what he is going through. Much like, for example, what a nutritionist would do, sit across the table and you know, get a diet plan, understand their lifestyle, so on and so forth. Um, and then over the last couple of hundred years, we started to evolve fairly significantly. For example, the thermometer was um, invented and it allowed you to measure the temperature approximately. Previously, they were used to touch the skin and feel the temperature, but now with the thermometer, you could approximately measure the temperature. And fortunately, today we have digital thermometers that can tell you precisely uh, what the temperature is down to a decimal point. The point that I'm trying to make is that technology has evolved. Different types of tools have evolved over a period of time. And they have allowed us to do things that we were not able to do before. And um, I want to recall the adage which says, what can be measured can only be improved. You have to be able to measure it. If you don't know what your weight is, you can't have a target weight. You need to know what you weigh, and then you need to know where you're going. So in, these, in, in the evolution of tools, molecular tools, uh, there are digital tools, there are molecular tools, for example, at one point in time in human history, we were not able to measure HbA1c. We didn't know what it was. Today we can, right? So we have a lot many more molecular tools today than we had before, and it's going to continue to expand into the future. And my key point in this slide is genetics is one of these tools. It's not the only tool, it's one of these tools. And it allows you to construct a more fuller picture of human health. For example, if I only tell you the BMI of an individual and nothing else, you don't have a full picture of this individual. I need to give you as many data points as I can. And it's your job as a professional to try to gather as, ma as many data points as you can in constructing a full picture of the individual that you're about to help. So genetics is one of the key tools. It uh, is a very, very recent tool and it's going to become very prevalent in the future. So how did we get here? When did genetics start and uh, where is it today? So in this chart, you see two lines. Uh, there's a blue line and there's a red line. I want, you, I want to draw your attention to that. The blue line is um, the rate at which the cost of computing dropped over the last 10 years or so. And uh, the reason I have it there is, for example, if you remember the first computers that came in the 1960s, 1970s, they occupied an entire room and they costed a lot of money, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'm sure almost all of you have smartphones with you. Each one of those phones is much more powerful than the first computer that costed hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And what allowed that to happen 
uh, like people in remote parts of Africa and India, they have smartphones. They, 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 they don't have reliable electricity, but they have smartphones that connect them to the rest of the world. And what allowed, what enabled this is the blue curve, the rate at which the cost of computing dropped over the last two decades. Now, what is interesting is the red curve is the rate at which the cost of genomics is dropping over the same period of time. You can see it's a lot more dramatic, right? So now we can sequence the entire human genome in a couple of days for about a thousand dollars and that is continuing to drop, right? So what this means for you as practitioners is you're going to get many more people show up in your office over the next coming years with their genetic data in their hands and expect you to be able to understand and to be able to use it in personalizing your services to them. So it is a coming wave and it is important that you are aware of it and uh, you equip yourself to be able to handle this. So how do we understand genetics? What really is genetics? Right? One way that I find interesting to understand genetics is being able to look at the different organisms, the different multicellular organisms. They are different, but they are also similar. Um, for example, you see all of them have the architecture of four limbs. They all have a head, they have eyes, they have the cardiovascular system. They have pretty much a lot in common, right? But if I were to show you at the single cell level what these organisms look like, you won't be able to tell the difference, right? In fact, uh, what is fascinating is every one of us in this meeting and every one of us alive today, our journey into uh, our journey to who um, you know, the, the way we look and who we are actually started at a single cell level. So you, you know, as a grown adult, you probably have about close to 4 trillion cells in your body. But at one point in time, you were a single cell, right? And all that information that made you who you are today, including your skin color to your eye color to everything, I mean, you know, what, you know, what is on the outside, what is on the inside, everything originated with one single cell. And genetics is that information that created this organism from that cell. It's a code, it's a formula that built you, right? that sustains you. So every single chemical reaction that is, goes on inside of you, all proteins that are built, and every process inside the body is actually coded inside the genes and they execute it day in and day out. So in other words, the genetics is the software that actually makes the hardware. All right, so let's take an example. Let's look at some examples of what happens if um, there are some errors of any sort in this um, software code. For example, we all know that we are supposed to have, uh, most of us have five digits in our fingers and some of us have six um, and some of us have four. So the software code, the genetic code that regulates the five digits, and there is an anomaly in it that leads to different types of digits. And um, Sometimes there is an anomaly in the genetic code that regulates how much body hair one is supposed to have. Uh, so this leads to a condition called hypertrichosis. And um, so this is an extremely rare genetic condition where legs are fused together. It's called a mermaid syndrome. And this is also very common, uh, cleft palate, it's, which is a genetic abnormality. And so one of the reasons these examples stand out is because they are dramatic. You can observe them. For example, if you take a room full of 100 people, most of them will have five digits. So when you spot someone with a six digit, they stand out. But if you go to Africa, most people there are going to have a darker skin tone. So they won't stand out from each other. You go to China, uh, most people will have certain features. They won't stand out in their populations and you go to certain different parts of the world, people have different characteristics, right? The reason for that is they have adapted through evolutionary history to have those characteristics permanently for a good reason. So for example, when you see there are people with wide eyes, narrow eyes, there are people with slender body type, there are people with short and wide body type, the skin tone is different among people, 
due to, uh, I'll explain as to why these characteristics came about, but I want to draw your attention to the different types of characteristics on the outside that you see in people. And I want to, the point that I want to make is these are not random. So we assume, or we usually think that, oh, this person has uh, this feature, that feature, um, but we don't reflect on why they have that feature. And my point being that there is an evolutionary history to the different features that people carry, right? One example I would like to give uh, at this point is for example, um, when people, most people live at close to sea level, the amount of oxygen is a certain percentage in the atmosphere at the sea level. But as you begin to go up, as you give, begin to go um, up the mountains and stuff, the amount of oxygen is lesser and lesser. So people who live there, who have lived there for hundreds of generations have to have some kind of a mechanism inside of them to compensate for this uh, decrease in oxygen at higher altitudes. And there are a few different ways of doing it. And one way of doing it is um, by having high levels of RBC. RBC helps you to extract the um, more oxygen from the atmosphere with each breath. So if there is less oxygen in the atmosphere, then you would have to produce more RBC. One other adaptation is hyperventilation. People will breathe more often per minute than uh, what people would do at sea level. So these are different types of adaptations that are permanently coded inside the genome because our ancestors have been living in a certain envi environment for a very, very long time. And uh, these are some more examples. Okay, so naturally, uh, one question to ask is if it is true that you know it's uh, um, it, it is a simple software code that actually runs our bodies, is it possible to change this code? And the answer today is yes. Um, for example, what you see here on the right hand side is the zebra fish. It's, it's a very simple fish. Uh, that's the natural color. That's how nature produces it you know, in a very kind of colorless manner. But then scientists can induce or infuse this zebrafish genome with genes from other type of species to actually produce these beautiful looking colorful fish. And they're actually called glowfish. You can commercially buy them. I think a company out of Canada is manufacturing these. So that aside, um, humans have always known for, for several centuries now that there are mutant organisms that are present in nature. Nature produces them. These are genetic anomalies. They are not normal, they are different. Um, for example, this particular bull that you see uh, is famous for supporting double the amount of muscle compared to a, uh, another bull, the, the regular normal bull. And one of the reasons that happens is this organism carries a mutation called the myostatin mutation, which allows it to have double the amount of muscle compared to the other organisms. It's also found in certain breeds of dogs and things like that. And, um, you know, one, the, the question then becomes if nature can do this, can we also do this? Can we, uh, can we artificially do this? So scientists in China produced these uh, uh, pigs uh, for the pork industry, which have double the amount of muscle. They have recreated what nature does here in this uh, organisms that are um, created in the lab. And FDA approved uh, for human consumption a genetically modified salmon a few years ago, uh, which grows to twice the size of a regular salmon in the same amount of time. So the, the, to answer the question, genetic technology is progressing very, very fast. Uh, today's discussion is mostly about reading the genetics, but uh, what we are seeing is uh, genetics the applications of genetics is very fast expanding into editing the genetics. You know, for example, can I, uh, you know, maybe there are some countries, um, some have been in the news for this. They are now contemplating, can we produce uh, Usain Bolt, you know, with the genetics uh, or can we produce tall basketball players? Can we do this? Can we do that? Um, the answer to those questions is um, theoretically, all this is possible today with the technology we have but we don't, we haven't ethically still accepted these things. And uh, I think things will take their own course as we go along. So when you travel around the world, when you see different types of people, um, naturally you ask, 
why are these people different why do they look different what's the story behind them and you can observe many morphological features that are different uh, the skin color is different the nose morphology is different the eyes are different but these are not random changes they are adaptive changes that these are features that are embedded in these people uh, over centuries depending on where they have lived their ancestors have lived um, you know for a very long time so uh, regardless of where you live today whether it's uh, bangladesh or uk or india we all came about 250000 years ago from the same place um, it's in central africa and then our ancestors moved through the world and settled in different places and we have lived there in these places for past several generations so depending on where we settled is the kind of features that you see in yourself um for example for example if um, our as if our people in india who have lived there for several hundred generations uh, and close to the equator they will they probably have a darker skin tone and so on and so forth so one example i want to provide is um you know if you take someone from northern europe and take people from africa uh, these dark skin individuals are called african pygmies um they are known that way because their stature is small and um, the reason they their the their body is um, small is because they have lived in a desert environment for several hundred generations so that means that the desert environment is not rich in calories it doesn't provide a lot of calories so over many 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 generations the body adapts to it by being small and obviously the skin tone the skin tone is dark because africa sees a lot of sunlight so when you expose yourself to sunlight a lot there is a melanin production to protect you from the uv rays and that gives the darker texture to the individual so here is the example here is the global map of uh, skin pigmentation people around africa around the equator are likely to have a darker pigmentation and that is to protect that is because of melanin production to protect from the uv damage and due to migration when people moved out to different uh, northern climates what you see is um, what you see is lighter skin tone and that's because the sun exposure in the northern environment is less so that means the melanin melanin has to be reduced for vitamin d production so away from the equator lighter lighter skin tone closer to the equator darker skin tone so we spoke a lot about morphology meaning like what happens on the outside you know the shape of the nose and and uh, skin tone and so on and so forth but what about the inside how can the bodies be different on the inside and how can that adaptation happen in relation to the environment for example the i mentioned that the darkest skin tone happens because of exposure to the sunlight um uh, intense sunlight over many hundreds of generations correct so can that happen for example if i expose myself to uh, a certain food over several hundred generations can i expect to have a certain adaptive change so here's the global map of lac lac lactose intolerance like for example one thing about lactose one thing about milk is uh, humans are quite unique we are the only species that tend to consume milk throughout our lifetime and we are the only species that also consumes the milk of another species Uh, there's no other species that actually does this right and uh, if you look at the history of how this came about how we you know uh, how this whole adaptation came about and allowed us to drink milk for the for, for the entire duration about 10000 years ago is when approximately humans went from uh, hunter gatherer lifestyle to more agricultural and pastoralist lifestyle which is having livestock domesticating cattle and so on and so forth and when we did that uh we started to consume cow's milk and some of us uh, at the beginning was only a very few people that have these mutations uh had the ability to produce lactase uh, for the entire lifetime usually what happens is that the lactase enzyme is produced inside the body during childhood up to the period of weaning after that the the enzyme turns itself off right so because we don't need it because adult animals don't drink milk they move on to other food sources Uh, but in some cases this turning off doesn't happen they continue to 
have lactase for the rest of their life. And these individuals have a survival advantage because when the food is scarce, they can still drink milk and be alive. And that's an advantage. Um, here is an example of um, the prevalence of lactose intolerance in India. It's about 70% um, of the people cannot uh, tolerate milk. This is one example of, um, of nutritional adaptation through genetics. Here's another interesting example of uh, nutritional adaptation, right? For example, EPA and DHA is produced in the body. So if, if your ancestors happen to be vegetarians, your body is extremely well adapted to consume plant-based omegas and convert it into EPA and DHA. Otherwise, EPA and DHA is available straight from animal sources, particularly from marine sources. But if your ancestors happen to be vegetarians over the last several hundred, hundred generations, your body is extremely well adapted to take plant-based omegas and convert them into to EPA and DHA. One of the side effects of it is the uh, arachidonic acid is produced in the body, which is an inflammatory, it, it's a harmful substance. So if you take someone who has been a vegetarian, whose ancestors have been a vegetarian for, for several hundred generations, and you put them on a plant, um, um, sorry, edible seed oil-based diets, which are very, very rich in omega-6, there is a spike in arachidonic acid production because this biological machine is extremely efficient in converting the um, plant-based omega-6 into arachidonic acid and predisposing them to cancer and heart disease risk. So the summary of this section is what you see in the organism in terms of the looks and the health um, and predisposition to different conditions, response to medications, fitness and, and uh, food metabolism. It's a combination of genetics and epigenetics. Genetics is what is in your genes. Epigenetics is how these genes interact with the environment. Um, the example is you are sitting inside the room, you have a certain skin tone. When you, when you go outside and expose yourself to sun, what happens is there is a change in that tone. There is tanning response inside your skin because the cells are producing more melanin to, to, to um, safeguard you from UV radiation. So that's epigenetics. Interaction of your genes with the environment is epigenetics. So everything about you is a combination of your genetics and epigenetics. Okay, so my next section is precision medicine. Uh, I'm not sure if there are physicians in this session, but I will still go through this section for the sake of completeness. Um, and I think there are some general points that uh, the audience can appreciate. Before I get into this, I want to give you an example of um, alcohol. Medicines um, that we consume are really nothing more than small molecules. And um, alcohol is also a molecule. So if you take about a room full of people, say a hundred people, and you give them all one glass of alcohol, they will all not have the same response. Some of them will feel drunk, some of them will feel no difference, and everybody else will be somewhere in between, right? The same molecule in the same quantity produces different effects. The reason for that is this molecule is metabolized, converted inside the body with the help of enzymes. And the enzymes are produced by genes depending on what version of the gene they have, in this particular case is alcohol dehydrogenase, depending on what version of the gene they have, they will have different outcomes to the same exact molecule. And medicine is no different, whether it's headache medicine or any other medicine that you take, without understanding your genetics, you wouldn't know exactly how effective this medicine is going to be. Unfortunately, today it's not practiced yet, but in the future, almost all medicine will be personalized medicine they will not be prescribed without understanding your genetics first. So this initiative was launched way back in uh, when Obama was president. And um, you know, during the launch, he mentioned most medical treatments have been designed for the average patient. Treatments can be very successful for some patients, but not for others. Obviously this is applicable in nutrition and dietetics too. Most diets, for example, when you say low carbohydrate, low fat, most diets will, are designed for the average person, assuming that the mechanism inside this person's are the same. 
they are similar, but they are not the same. Um, these are some statistics about what happens when the right drug is not given to the right person. Um, adverse drug reactions are still fourth to sixth leading cause of death. And uh, these are some percentages on how many people that the drugs are prescribed to, but they won't respond. For example, in the case of antidepressants, about 40% of the people will not respond to commonly prescribed antidepressants and so on and so forth that asthma drugs and cancer drugs. And interestingly, about 80% of all prescription drugs are metabolized by five main enzymes inside the body, the CYP2D6, CYP2C19, C9, and 3A45. And there are generally four different types of people, poor metabolizer, intermediate, normal, ultra rapid metabolizer. So for any given drug, you could be any one of them. You could be a poor metabolizer, you could be a normal metabolizer or ultra rapid. So if you happen to be a poor metabolizer of the drug, you need lower doses of it. If you happen to be intermediate, you need slightly higher. And if you happen to be ultra, ultra rapid metabolizer, you may completely not be able to use it. You have to be given an alternative drug. So in pharmacogenetics, genomics, the paradigm is the same medicine doesn't go for everyone. Um, the same medicine either needs to be dose modulated, meaning larger or smaller doses have to be given to certain individuals or certain individuals have to be completely on a different medication. Obviously, there are several advantages to this um, approach. FDA is uh, taking notice of this. There are 137 drugs on their list and more and more are being added on a regular basis uh, in terms of pharmacogenomic um, indications of these drugs. So um, Xcode provides different reports. One of the reports is on pharmacogenetic testing and uh, we provide the status of different types of uh, SIP enzymes and what your outcome is and, and for, for each one of these. And there are close to 50 plus pharmacogenetic markers that we cover. Okay, so moving on to the next topic, which is um, predisposition to different conditions, particularly lifestyle conditions like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. According to WHO, 80% of premature heart disease, stroke, and diabetes can be prevented. And according to Center for Disease Control, 75% of all healthcare costs today are preventable, and 70% of all deaths are preventable. And for most of the for most of the health conditions, there are two components. There's obviously the environmental risk factors like smoking, alcohol, excessive eating, and so on and so forth. And uh, but there is also a strong strong genetic component to several diseases. For example, Alzheimer's is known to have a particular gene called APOE, which influences your predisposition to Alzheimer's. Breast cancer, there is uh, a gene called BRCA which gives a higher predisposition to certain women who carry that particular gene. And there are several other cancers which have very strong genetic markers. And obesity and type two diabetes, um, these are uh, influenced by many, many genes. So uh, we calculate what is known as polygenic risk score. And based on that risk score, you're able to tell the genetic contribution to that particular disease. Um, this is fascinating because so far the genetic component has been completely ignored. And that's why we see a lot of anomalies. For example, not everybody who is overweight goes on to develop a disease. And not everybody who is lean is disease-free. There are plenty of lean people who are diabetic, so on. So because um, you know, we were confounded by these things because we didn't have the right tools uh, in the absence of genetics. We didn't understand the genetic component, but now we do. OK, coming to the final segment of my presentation, which is on um, genetics and epigenetics pertaining to human nutrition, uh, what we see is um, the confounding of, if you take two individuals, all else being equal, give them the same type of diet, give them the same types of exercises, but the outcomes are different. They don't have the same outcome, they have different outcomes. And uh, this has been confounding so far in the absence of genetic information. But thankfully today we have a decent amount of genetic information. It's still nascent, it's still in the early stages, but I think relatively good enough for us to begin in introducing this into our practices. But I wanted to first discuss with you the aspect of obesity um, worldwide. Close to 30% of the global population is considered to be 
um, obese or close to obese. And um, initially it was thought that obesity is a condition of the rich, meaning people who can afford a lot of food, gorge themselves on food and then become obese. Unfortunately, the data point over the last decades indicate that uh, much of obesity is really prevalent in what is known as middle income countries or developing countries. And that's because of the availability of the wrong kind of food, um, right? For example, the carbohydrate rich, refined carbohydrate food that is now widely available throughout the world. So even, you know, and it's also cheap. So people who are in the low income bracket are able to afford more and more of this food, which is leading to uh, obesity prevalence worldwide. When it comes to human body types, uh, morphologically though, before we get into the genetics morphologically, we were able to appreciate that broadly there are three types of human bodies, the ectomorph, the mesomorph, and the endomorph, uh, differentiating within themselves by, by means of the musculoskeletal structure, muscle fiber composition, adiposity, uh, hormone rates, enzymatic levels, and the metabolic rate. And how do we understand? So this is on the outside. What you see here is on the outside. But what is happening on the inside? What are the differences that you see? And why did this differences came about? I think that is important to understand because technically you can get into every single gene and understand the allele and the genotype and all that. But I think you as a nutritionist and dietitians, it is important for you to understand, to make the client understand the context of why these changes came about. These changes came about because we have a very, very deep history. And uh, although you were born maybe about 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, you can trace back your ancestry to your, to your parents. Obviously they can trace it back to their parents. And if you keep going through that chain, uh, you have to ask yourself, how far back can you go? And the answer is you can go all the way back to the first life form on this planet, which is approximately about 3 billion years ago is when that event happened. The first unicellular organisms began populating the planet. And we are all today a derivative of that process that happened about 3 billion years ago. So if I can trace my ancestry to my father and his father and mother all the way back, I can keep going all the way to the first organism on the planet. Because if that chain was ever broken, uh, I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here. Right. So the fact that we are in this seminar tells us that you know, that, you know, we have been transmitted from the beginning all the way till today. And what is in your genes is that story of that adaptation of oh, where your ancestors had lived. At some point in time, they were tropical. Um, you know, the 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 uh, uh, the the primate ancestors of humans were mostly tropical, they lived on fruits and berries. So we have a lot of genes that are optimized to take fruits and berries and function well. And then we transitioned to hunter-gatherer types of lifestyles. Uh, we stayed there for several centuries. And then recently we transitioned to agricultural pastoralist lifestyle, which is more rich in carbohydrates. That adaptation is still ongoing. One of the examples of that adaptation um, you know, we read about is the amylase gene, which is a starch processing gene. So about 10, 15,000 years ago, when we made the transition to agricultural lifestyle, the copy numbers, the number of copies of the amylase gene that we carry has increased in certain populations to help us deal with it. And if you look at people who have lived in Antarctica and colder regions for very, very long time, hundreds of, hundreds of generations, they don't have all different types of fruits and vegetables and all that. They live on steel, uh, you know, uh, seal blubber and uh, fish. That's their primary diet. Their bodies are optimized for that kind of food. So if you take someone whose body is not optimized for that kind of food and give them that kind of food, they will have all kinds of problems, right? So it is about understanding that rich history um, of evolutionary adaptation that is in your genes and optimizing you for that particular diet that you're uh, already built for. So generally, the, if you look at the role of genes um, in nutrition, it is quite broad-based. Uh, in fact, it, it spans everything from the desire for food, the desire for certain types of foods, and the taste of food. For example, there are genes that encode the uh, taste perception, bitter taste perception, sweet taste perception, and your response to those type of foods, and how that food is transported, broken down enzymatically, metabolized, bound and transported through the blood and received inside the cells. Every one of these steps 
is regulated through proteins and enzymes. And all of these, every one of these are actually regulated by specific genes or specific set of genes. Broadly speaking though, um, what happens is at birth, um, you're like a, a shuffled deck of card. For example, your father has a deck, your mother has a deck. You are a combination of both, right? So you, you get one card from your father, one card from your mother. This is a very, very simplistic example. For example, say number seven regulates carbohydrate metabolism. You get one copy of number seven from your father and one from your mother. They don't have to be the same. They can be different uh, and so on and so forth. And depending on what combination you received is, is how you will manifest yourself. Um, so we looked at it a little bit as to what are the factors for obesity and overweight and uh, lifestyle plays a big role, but genetics also plays a significant role in some estimates about 40 to 70% of obesity is genetically mediated. And here are some genes, uh, for example, the um, food selection genes that impact food selection and genes that impact cognitive behavior with regards to eating. Uh, leptin is a gene that is known to produce the leptin hormone. And the job of leptin hormone is to signal to your brain that you have eaten to your full capacity and now you can stop feeding. That's how you know that you're full and you should stop eating. Um, and there are a set of genes, for example, like you notice when you're having tea or coffee with some individuals, some individuals are happy with one spoon of sugar. Some people need two, some people need three. And that is because the number of taste receptors on their tongue are different and their sensitivity is also different. So they need more sugar to sense the sweetness that you can sense with one spoon of sugar. And this obviously they're doing subconsciously, but being aware of such genetics can actually help them modulate their behavior in a positive way. And ghrelin is a hormone, it's known as the hunger hormone. It is the hormone that signals to your brain that your glucose levels are running low and that you should go and seek food um, and, and so on. There are several examples of uh, genes that have been researched and uh, shown to be associated with different aspects of eating. This is the sample report of what we provide through Xcode as a nutrition report. Uh, let me just switch back a little bit and show you uh, our full report. Um, sorry, I'm not able to, one second. Yeah, okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, so this is a nutrition report that we produce and uh, has different sections to it. Um, this is a summary section we broadly, based on all your genetics, um, we indicate as to what could be the optimal um, ratio of the macros for you. And some important things that you need to pay attention to if you don't have the time, if you don't have the time to look through the entire report now. Um, we indicate the gluten sensitivity, lactose intolerance, alcohol flush, and the important micronutrients that you might need to care about. And this is the summary section. And these are the different traits that are covered in this report. Tendency to gain weight, overeat. These are behavioral aspects of eating and um, preferences for different types of foods, fatty foods, sweet foods, bitter foods, and the sensitivity to different macros and, and weight gain tendency. And um, several, several um, traits are included and we continue to include more and more on an ongoing basis, different vitamins and micronutrients. For example, uh, I'll give you one example here. Um, if you look at uh, vitamin A, vitamin A can be obtained from animal sources. From plant sources, you only obtain carotenoids and which needs, which need to be converted through an enzymatic reaction. And some people have a gene that is not, that does not produce an efficient enzyme. So if two people consume the same amount of carotenoids, one of them might be consuming them into retinols more efficiently than others. And like that, we have several other examples 
on uh, different vitamins and micronutrients that you may be genetically predisposed to require more. So we have close to about 35 traits now. And, and then you get into the detailed section of each one of these, which explains what this is about and also gives you very specific recommendations on for your genetic type, what is it that you need to do? Okay, so I think uh, that pretty much brings me to the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.